So in this short video, we're going to have a look at the factors affecting the horizontal distance travelled by a projectile. Projectile motion then, definition, the movement of a body through the air following a curved flight path under the force of gravity. A projectile is um, something that's travelling through the air. So again, to define it, a projectile is a body launched into the air which is subject to weight and air resistance. We, we already know that as an athlete or a, um, a ball or a javelin or whatever, something travelling through the air, once it leaves the floor, it's got two forces acting on it, weight and air resistance. And that makes it a projectile, okay? Um, so projectile motion is is the looking at then and the study of the flight path that that projectile takes once it's been launched into the air. Um, so once in the air, the projectile follows a curved flight path. So the trajectory that a projectile follows, um, or the flight path, sorry, that a projectile follows is called its trajectory. So uh, we might think of an aeroplane taking off and travelling into the sky, and that would be its trajectory, a straight line up into the, the sky, because it's got an engine, it's able to overcome um, its weight and air resistance due to its engine. But for us in sport, a projectile, they don't have engines, um, and so when they're in the air, there's only weight and air resistance acting on them. And it causes the projectile to travel in this sort of shape, an upside down U. Might be like this, uh, might be like this. Uh, but there are all these upside down U shapes which are called parabolas. Might in fact be like this um, or like this, okay? But they're all upside down U's um, and they're all referred to as parabolas. Um, so a projectile in sport, no engine, just weight and air resistance acting on it, it causes a curved trajectory, which is specifically known as a parabola. Now, on the specification, we're looking at factors that affect the horizontal distance travelled by a projectile. Um, so we've got to think about sports where we want maximum horizontal distance and maybe sporting context where we are looking for something else from a parabola. So have a quick think, maybe pause the video, think of some examples in sport where an athlete is going to um, launch either themselves or an implement into the, into the air and they want that implement to travel as far as it possibly can horizontally. And then maybe some examples where a person might launch themselves or an implement into the air and might not necessarily be looking for that projectile to travel as far as possible horizontally. So some examples here, obviously we've got a long jumper. This long jumper is looking to, um, the long jumper is looking to travel as far horizontally as possible. They take off from the ground and they want them while they're in the air to travel the maximum horizontal distance. Uh, similarly with the shot putter, it's released, once that once that shot putter is released it becomes a projectile, it's got weight and air resistance acting on it and the, the shot putter is trying to get that disc, uh, the shot put to travel as far horizontally as possible. Um, but in this case the high jumper is also a projectile um, and obviously for them they're not looking to travel as far horizontally as possible, they're looking to travel as far vertically as possible but against a small amount of horizontal distance and then in racket sports maybe in football we might be trying to kick or hit um, an implement not necessarily for it to travel as far as possible but maybe for it to turn in the air or for it to drop suddenly um, so if we got asked a question or we're thinking about projectiles and the factors that affect the horizontal distance of a projectile um, the first question we should ask is, okay, do we, are we looking for this projectile to travel as far horizontally as possible or are we looking to achieve something else? So if we are looking for this uh, projectile to travel as far horizontally as possible, there are four factors that we can manipulate as athletes to make this projectile travel as far as possible. And they are the speed of release, the height of release, the angle of release and the aerodynamic factors that might be um, might be uh, happening to this projectile. Uh, we're going to focus in this video on speed of release, height of release and angle of release. We're going to look at aerodynamic factors uh, in a future video, okay? 
let's take speed of release first. It, speed of release is the biggest effect. It has the biggest effect on horizontal distance. If, if you as an athlete can train yourself to release the projectile um, at a faster speed, it will have the biggest impact on your performance. Whether that projectile is you as a long jumper, if you can hit that board and leave that board faster and faster, you will go further and further. Or whether the projectile is an implement like the javelin here. If as an athlete we can train ourselves to bring this arm through faster and faster, this javelin will travel furthest. And that links us back to Newton's law of acceleration. The greater the force applied to a projectile, the greater the change in momentum and therefore acceleration. So the greater the force, the greater the speed, the greater the speed, the greater the acceleration, the greater the acceleration, the greater the horizontal distance travelled by the projectile. Um, oh, and I wanted to maybe bring our thoughts back here to third class levers as well. We've talked about third class lever systems. We know one's happening uh, here to throw the javelin in the arm. We've got the third class lever system. Um, obviously, it has a mechanical disadvantage. This, this javelin throw is putting in a huge amount of effort in order to throw what is a relatively light object, the javelin, through the air. Um, but with the third class lever system, we've got a long lever and that's allowing us to generate a large amount of acceleration over a great range of motion. The athlete here has been able to drop the javelin back due to the range of motion um, here, drop it back nice and far and then bring it all the way through. And you'll see the athlete's got a straighter arm as possible when they release this javelin. And that means that it's as high as possible, which is going to bring us on to our next factor. Um, so our second factor is height of release. If speed of release and angle of release and aerodynamics are all the same, the higher the release height, the further the horizontal distance travelled due to the increased amount of time in the air. So if we had two um, javelin throwers, one of them, so here's the first javelin uh, thrower, it's a huge javelin, and um, our second javelin thrower, okay, assuming the speed is the same, the angle is the same, the aerodynamics acting on the javelin are the same, then the higher the release height, the further it would travel. So this athlete would be able to throw their javelin further because they're release, able to release the, the javelin um, from a greater height, from a, a, a higher release height. Um, and that's going to, yeah, that's going to allow this athlete to, to throw it further. So if I were picking a javelin thrower from a lineup of 10, I would choose the person with the, um, who is the tallest with the longest arms and that means I'm going to get the highest release height as long as you get the technique right and they have the potential to throw this javelin further um, and that brings us to this idea of positive and negative release height so with a, 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 a shot put thrower let's say this time um, this is the release height and obviously the shot putter is stood on the ground and the landing height is here. This is the landing height. This is the release height. And we have a difference here. Um, obviously, if we drew this across, we have what we call here, therefore, a positive release height. We're releasing the implement from a higher than it is going to land. Okay. Um, by contrast, we can have negative release heights. Um, and a good example of this is a golfer. Um, so we might have a golfer, um, obviously, we've got the golf ball here. Uh, but this golfer might be in a bunker or something where they're trying to get the ball up here somewhere. So this time, the landing height is here. The release height is here. This time, if we were to draw that across, this time we have what's called a negative release height. It means that the ball's going to land higher, or the implement, the projectile, is going to land higher than it was released from. 
Um, sometimes we don't have a negative or a positive release height. So for example, um, with a long jumper, with a long jumper, where the long jumper takes off and where they land from is the same. They're going to take off here um, from this point and they're going to land in the sand at this point. There's no positive or negative release height. There's no difference. So that brings us on to our third um, factor affecting the horizontal distance travelled by a projectile and that is angle of release. So if the speed, height and aerodynamics are all the same, then the angle of release has a big impact on the horizontal distance travelled. If the angle of release is 90 degrees to the floor, the projectile would travel straight up and down. So if we've got the ground here and we launch a projectile, something here on the ground, we launch it into the air ooh, straight up like this at 90 degrees to the floor, then that thing is going to travel straight up and then it's going to travel straight back down again. Okay, land where it left off from essentially. If the angle of release is greater than 45 degrees to the floor, the projectile reaches its peak height and drops quickly. So if we um, launch it not at 90 degrees, but more than 45 degrees, it's going to travel up and then it's going to come back down to the ground very quickly. Okay, uh, So that's a, a release height of greater than, uh, than 45 degrees. If, on the other hand, we have a release height less than 45 degrees, let's say 30 degrees, then that projectile doesn't spend very long in the air. It's going to um, achieve a really low height and therefore has a limited time in the air. It's going to hit the ground again quite quickly. Okay. So we can see here different flight paths on the graph. This is a this is assuming we have no positive or negative release height. So the the projectile is taking off at the same height where it's landing. Um, so if we were to launch a projectile into the air at 75 degrees, it would travel up very quickly and then back down very steeply and quickly. Closer to the closer to 45 degrees that we get, the less steep that takeoff is and the less steep the um the the trajectory back down to the floor and so we gain a, a larger horizontal distance when we are at 45 degrees that in this case is where we're seeing the maximum horizontal distance because we get a good height into the air not too high that we're going to drop straight back down again but a good height into the air which gives us a good amount of time in the air and allows the projectile to travel its furthest um, 60 degrees is obviously 15 degrees more than 45, 30 degrees is 15 degrees less and they're comparable, directly comparable in terms of horizontal distance travelled. Um, so if we did the same speed and height of release and had the same object and we, we threw one up at 60 degrees and one at 30, they would both land in the same place. Um, this one isn't getting enough time in the air. So it, it effectively lands on the floor before it before it needed to, before it ran out of energy. It just never got into the air for long enough. Um, so an angle of 45 degrees is optimum to achieve the greatest horizontal distance if the release height and landing height are equal. Okay, so only for things like a long jumper where they're going to take off and land at the same height is 45 degrees the optimum really angle of release. Um, but we'd already spoken about the fact that with a shot putter, we've got this positive release height and with a golfer, we've got the negative release height. So with a positive um, release height, we're looking actually for something less than 45 degrees because it's already got its increased flight time due to the, the, the height of release. Um, and so it can afford to have more energy sort of um, being put into it to go that way rather than that way. We don't need to gain extra height, so we can we can aim to throw it uh, further by reducing the release height. If there's a negative release height, we're going to want more than 45 degrees. So let's look at some examples. So we've got our shot putter, um, and we know with the shot putter we've got a positive release height because the shot putter has the shot put 
at the start when they release it higher than where they're aiming to land it okay so at 45 degrees in this case it would travel up up at 45 degrees and then back down it would land somewhere here okay whereas so that one's our 45 degrees um whereas if we take maybe a 35 degree lower it travels lower but then it's going to travel further okay so this now is our 35 degree release angle of release so if we've got a positive release height which we have here it's it's landing lower down than it was released then we want something like uh, something lower than 45 degrees and this would depend on the height of the person the taller the shot putter the lower this number could be to get the maximum horizontal distance traveled the shorter the shot putter the closer to 45 degrees that that perfect angle of release would be that's with our positive release height um, if we do an example then um, the golf example where we know we had a negative release height again if we draw in the ground we've got that bunker um, and we've got our golfer down here with extremely short legs um, and now we've got that negative release height this time if we release at um, at 45 degrees so we're going to come up at 45 degrees and then back down at 45 degrees we're going to land somewhere here whereas so that's worth denoting there 45 degrees if we angle it a little bit higher this time maybe 55 degrees it's going to travel up further and then down and it's going to, because I haven't drawn that, the peak um, at the same place there, have I? So it's going to travel up a lot further and then down and it's going to achieve a greater horizontal distance. This is our maybe 55 degree um, angle of release. So where we have um, a positive release height, Obviously, this is our landing height now. This is our release height. Sorry, where we have a negative release height, we're looking for something greater than 45 degrees to achieve our maximum horizontal distance. And again, this would depend how deep is this bunker. The deeper the bunker, the bigger this number would need to be. Okay, so if we're coaching a thrower then, um, in athletics, the coach would encourage the athlete to, number one, release the implement slightly less than 45 degrees due to that positive release height, uh, to release it at the highest point possible and um, at, its, at the highest speed possible. There would be the three sort of coaching areas that we could focus on to make sure an, um, a thrower could throw that implement as far as possible. If it were a jumper, then it would be at 45 degrees because there's no positive release height, but we'd still be looking for the highest point um, possible, which is the ground, isn't it? And the highest speed as possible. For, so for a jumper, really, the things that they would focus on is the 45 degree takeoff angle and get in, hitting that board and leaving the board at as, as high a speed as possible. Um, so that's the end of the video. I thought you might want to go back and use this as a chance for some revision um, because if, if as a coach we're thinking about that, what component of fitness might we want this person then to work on? What method of training might they use to improve that component of fitness? Um, how would they test that component of fitness? Which muscle fibres would they expect to be affected through that training? And what specific adaptations would they, they expect to see?